I think about it, I've been thinking about it up there while we were singing. This is a sermon probably I've, God has made me for um, since he called me back in the 80s. I was saved at 14 in 1982. And on the weekend of my birthday, uh, my 20th birthday in 1987, I was at a conference, uh, a bunch of young adults, college people, and at that time, I, I, I still look back and I believe that was when God put a calling on my heart. You could say it's a pastoral call. I don't know where that's going to lead me from here, but it has certainly culminated in this moment, because this, this sermon, is about families. Um, I didn't actually have this in my notes, but I was also thinking about the fact that my dad was an orphan. He was born in 1926, so I guess the Depression had, was about to happen. Um, but he was brought up in a foster family where uh, he really wasn't accepted. Um, it was because his dad and the, the head of that family were Lodge brothers. And I say this because um, he could never, he called the, the siblings his brothers, but they weren't really. They, they, he was never adopted. That's strange because he was brought up in that household, but he had to live with not being adopted. And I guess if you knew me since I was young, you might see evidence of that. You might see evidence of the insecurity that comes with that. The, um, plus, my dad, he did God bless him, he, uh, I guess he, he had to find out what family was like by joining the Army. So for 32 years, he served faithful in the Army and was saved um, just a few years before I was born. Thank God for that, that he came to Christ in time from my birth because my siblings, they didn't get to see that. Um, so, and it was hard. I, I learned uh, what family was like um, in a hard way. I also learned what, um, what other families are like and mine wasn't like. And so I guess for my whole life, I've, I've um, you know, thank God that he allowed Janet and me to start a family together almost 30 years ago and raise our four kids um, in, in, in the church. And yet, a lot of the, you might be surprised at how much was outside of the church. And I'm gonna to try to explain that a little bit here. Some historical perspective. Oh, by the way, the subtitle for this is, Are We a Bunch of Families? in the church, or all, are we one family in the household of God? Look at headlines today, for the last 50 or so years. Uh, Roe v. Wade was 1973, huge hit to the American families. And you know that the family is under attack. But read the Bible, and you'll know that the family was under attack from the Garden of Eden, with Adam and Eve. That's how we in inherited sin. It started with the first family, the first married couple. Um, you'll also see that the household of God has been under siege for thousands of years. The church has been around for about 2,000. That's how long the family has been under attack. The, the household of God, the church family. It, it, it's always been that way, okay? In our country, you may be aware of several Christian family organizations out there focused on the family, American Family Association, Promise Keepers, Family Research Council. Now, even if you've ever used any of them yourself as a resource or had any involvement with uh, any of them, uh, that's fine, but they're not your local church. Uh, we call them parachurch organizations. At most, they're there to help with the life of American families and the 
help fight for our constitutional rights as American families. But imagine if Christian families, all of Christian families were busy fulfilling God's purpose for his church, the household of God, the body, the bride of Christ. Would we need as much help from those organizations? Just something to think about. I'm not criticizing them. Um, God had a, a, a purpose for them. Um, can Christian families manage by being, you know, just biblical themselves, keep to themselves, maybe even have a church in their own home? Um, how about local churches? Are local churches meant to function on their own? Fathers, are you raising your sons to be your disciples or God for women? Mothers, are you raising your daughters to be disciples? How about, where did all the different denominations come from? How did they come to be? Aren't we, aren't we one big family, the household of God? Now, I'm going to try to focus right here. What are our family values here at Flushing Alliance Church? And how about our part in the Alliance family? So I've lived in many different parts of the country, and I've experienced many different churches in my own life. Um, many have been churches that were one or more generations old. Um, I would have to say, and, and I'm sure like many people can say, the reception by different churches, different members of different churches, can be from cold to warm, maybe rarely ever hot. This means a lot to me, though, because I'm not taking personal offense at it. You know, I've been through it. I've been through I know what it's like. My family knows what it's like to be in a church where we're not really made to feel welcome. I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm talking about years of experience. Because, um, <clears throat> you see, back around that same time, I told you about my calling. I became part of a church startup. In the late 80s and early 90s, I was really involved during my college years. I was a young adult. And those were my most definitive and formative church years, I would have to say. All these years later, I've never gotten over it um, because of how intense it was. I worked hard. I endured personal conflicts. Um, I was even discipled with what seemed like hard knocks. It was kind of like... Um, well, I guess you have to experience to know what I mean. Uh, discipling can be harsh. Discipling can also be pretty easy going. Um, I'm also one of those people with a really hard head, so maybe I needed those hard knocks. Um, no matter what we did when we were starting this church, it seemed like we were always the underdogs. Um, I guess if we were comparing ourselves to established churches, Big churches at the time, mega churches were becoming a thing. There was even talk of meta churches back then. Um, and I know the pastor that I was under, uh, that, you know, he really had a heart to see that happen. Well, that church became one of the biggest um, mega churches in West Virginia, if not the biggest. Um, my story kind of ended there in 1995 when Janet and I. Child, and then we had to move away. Um, I, I, at the time, I felt like a washout myself. I felt like a failure, I, like my tail was between my legs. And um, I call those my desert years. But regardless, I have no regrets about uh, having to leave at that time and missing out on experiencing that church turning into a mega church. I'm confident in the path that God led me to experience. Along the way, I have met families who are also much part of church plants. And I noticed similar burnout. I have also related with folks who you might relate, you tend to want to stay busy, do a whole lot of stuff, a lot of activities. And then you feel underappreciated or resentful of those who are not as busy as you. You're not there. Oh, they're not pulling their weight. I guarantee you, you'll find that in every church. 
Um, <clears throat> for years, I lived with the fact that my poor attitude during those years, um, in, in those young years, um, and lack of personal life, I believe I was poisoning the well. I believe I was uh, becoming a, a hindrance to that church. Um, but it's not all about me. Um, it's just good to, uh, that I didn't stay and possibly be, become, you know, I could have been there and maybe act like uh, I was all high and mighty and become conceited and act like I was a founding member. Make no mistake though, burnout is a sign of living or serving in the flesh. The Holy Spirit is a fire that never burns out though. However, each one of us is able to quench him. What about a whole church? Can a whole church quench the Holy Spirit? <clears throat> On reflection, it seems like it was necessary. They already talked about that, uh, the journey that brought us here. Um, families are vital to a church. Singles, don't feel like you're left out, especially if uh, God is calling you to be single. I'm not trying to alienate anybody by talking about families. Again, we're really talking about God's family. Imagine the pressures on a preacher's kid or kid of an elder or a deacon. Uh, one might feel entitled. You, you, you might see this play out. Um, you've heard about preacher's kid syndrome, maybe. I know I have. Uh, might feel entitled or like he has certain powers in the church or like he just... Um, you know, automatically going to inherit his dad's, you know, whatever, the glory of being a, a pastor. Uh, I myself, my dad was a deacon for many years in the church that uh, he settled in. And, um, but I also know what my home life was like. And I know the struggles my dad had and, and, and they and passed on to us. But even with some of the most famous pastors or preachers out there, think of Billy Graham. If you know the story of Franklin Graham, he was kind of like the ultimate preacher's kid story. He was a rebel. He, he went against his father. I, I don't really know how many years he was like this, where he was disobedient and living a fleshly life, but um, you know, we know where Franklin Graham is now. He didn't just inherit the Billy Graham Association. Uh, matter of fact, he went a hard route by working really hard with Samaritan's Purse and serving, feeding the poor and taking care of people in emergencies. And, and he's still an evangelist. As a matter of fact, you've seen pictures of him lately. He looks a lot like his dad. If you haven't seen him lately, you need to. It's amazing, the hair and the sideburns. Person's looking for a church home. Um, would they rather meet with hostility or indifference? Seeker-friendly uh, seeker or Christ-centered? Social club or the elect of God? Have any of you met with anything but love from any church congregation that you've been to? On the other hand, would you rather be in a church where you're held accountable or just left alone? And rather than point fingers, you know, the old saying, if I point fingers at anybody, I've got three more of my own fingers pointing back at me. Um, I have to ask myself, how would I treat strangers or family members? How did I myself regard visitors or fellow members when I was uh, a part of a, a young, growing church? Um, I have regrets about people that I alienated with my behavior and uh, the things I said and callousness. So, that's the introduction. Let's turn to the Word of God. But first, let's pray. Um, Heavenly Father, please show us your grace this morning. Let us all know that uh, now is the time to, uh, to just be who you want us to be as a people, as a church, as households, as individuals, and that the past can be the past. If anything, let us learn from the past, but teach us right now, Lord, um, how you want, uh, what you want from us as a church, and uh, speak to our hearts, and convict us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen.
So, <clears throat> this is not a text that I'm preaching. I'm not preaching from one text like Pastor Nathan does. There's actually several um, involved, but I'm basing it out of uh, James 4, 1 through 11. So if you want to turn with me to James 4, 1 through 11, again, I don't have anything for the screen, so. And there are Bibles in the pews if you don't have one. James 4, 1 through 11. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another. Brethren, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge one another? We might say, I don't, we don't fight amongst ourselves. How about indifference? Doing nothing for a visitor or a fellow member. James 4, 7, 17, I'm sorry. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing and does not do it, to him it is sin. A little bit more about uh, what goes on in our hearts as people in the church. From James 3, 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Keep in mind, these are strong words, but they're written, and they're written to the church. Not to unbelieving heathen. Some uh, important examples from Old Testament families. The first murderer was a jealous, ungodly brother against his godly brother. These were the first brothers ever. Cain and Abel. Another attempted murder was ten jealous, ungodly brothers against their, their godly half-brother. These were the sons of Israel, the prince, Jacob. A son of the king of Israel murdered his half-brother. Now, in the New Testament, words of, uh, uh, of Jesus, Mark 8, 
338. Mark, I'm sorry, Mark 8, 38. sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Is it in, you know, ask this to yourself, is it in your nature to help fellow church members in need or visitors or people who are associated with our church? I can tell you that it's not my nature that's my old nature. My old nature is full of hate and insecurity, fear. But my new nature is in Christ. So I can say, if any of us don't have this characteristic of just wanting to reach out to our brother or sister in Christ, there's a problem in our faith. 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now we've talked about striving, strife among families. How about when we feel like we have it all together? You know, there's nothing wrong with our church, or there's nothing wrong with our family, and we get really comfortable with ourselves. Well, God has something to say about that in James 2, 2 through 13. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ the Lord of glory with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my footstool, and you not show partiality, among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not commit murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So hopefully when outsiders come to our Sunday service, we as members greet them. But if we're going to greet them, is it going to be with honor or dishonor? Kindness, coldness, or contempt? Jesus himself, when he talked about murder, he says that hatred for someone is the same thing as murdering them. As in, 
We can be angry or envious of them, ignore them, or wish them away. That's uh, indifference. Indifference can be as harsh as just aggression or you know actively hating somebody or having anger against them. What about among each other? Jesus said in Matthew 5, 21 through 24, if you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, it's an Aramaic word, couldn't even translate it. But it shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Romans 12 beginning talks about offering ourselves as living sacrifices. That's like rendering service, being of service in the church. Well, I would go so far as to say Jesus is saying, don't even presume to do any service in the church if you have not dealt with conflicts, interpersonal conflicts. Feuds have no place in church families. This includes feuds between natural families. Have you ever played ball in a church league or hear about any of those who ever thought that was a good idea. I, co uh, I coached in a couple, and oh, you got nasty. <laughs> Unrepentant sin and interpersonal conflict drags down all of us. Itself, um, about how how are we, you know, how, how, how do people regard us as a church? Um, you know, I never got to experience being in a church where my family had been around for generations. My family started such and such church. I told you earlier that I could have been. I could have raised my kids in that church that I helped start and say, hey, see all this? This awesome church and you know, look at us. We're, we're awesome. And then uh, my kids, I can see how easily they can become conceited. Because, first of all, my own attitude could be, you know, very uh, offensive to God. How are my kids going to uh, learn from that? So, 1 John 1, 7 through 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We need to be honest about ourselves, okay? Let's not worry about what the other person is doing, okay? Well, if we see it and there's an offense, then in love, we try to help correct that, okay? 1 John 2, 9-14. One who says, this sounds familiar, one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. One who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. One who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Okay, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, again, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. John actually repeats that. I checked it out. I thought my, my notes repeated it, but 
He actually repeats that in the text. Um, back to families that, you know, ruling families, if you will. Some examples in the Old Testament, you know, Moses, Aaron, Miriam. Uh, Aaron was the first priest. He compromised. He allowed the children of Israel to just do whatever he wanted. He was afraid of them. He didn't speak out and make them, tell them, hold on, Moses is coming with the law. Miriam complained, the sister of Moses. She was among this hierarchy of, in Israel. God gave her leprosy. You hear the story of the priest Eli and his sons Hophni and Phinehas. They were abusive, corrupt priests. Samuel, the good judge and prophet, his own sons, well, you could accuse him of nepotism for making his own sons judges and they turn out to be corrupt. David and Absalom, Here's a priestly king who couldn't rule his household. And he almost lost the kingdom when his son Absalom uh, threw a rebellion against him. Here's one for you that you might not have ever thought about. Jeremiah. He was the son of Hilkiah, a priest, a temple priest. God had a greater calling for Jeremiah than his family priesthood. And as we see evident in the book of Jeremiah, the priests were kind of, they feared the king more than they feared God. Israel, we have lots of examples here in the Old Testament, but how about in the New Testament? You ever hear of a Canaanite woman with a sick daughter and she went to Jesus? She had the faith to know and the wisdom to know that Jesus would heal her daughter, even if they weren't Israelites. So what did Jesus say about her? You know, I haven't seen faith like this in all of Israel. It had to be an outsider. And this, this, the Israelites were supposed to be the family of God, his chosen people. Then we got the Pharisees. I won't get into that. But, um, how about a New Testament family? A family that was, I guess you could say genetically, connected to the Messiah himself, Jesus. When Mary and her sons went to speak with Jesus as he was publicly ministering, what did he say? You know, they told him, Jesus, your mother and your brother's outside. I want to speak with you. He said, who are my mother and brothers? The one who hear the word of God and do it are my mother and brothers. That's from Luke 18, or 8, 19 through 21. Some might interpret that as a denunciation or that his family was not faithful somehow. Yet, the text I read from, from James, James was one of those half-brothers. And Jude, another one, who wrote, you know, each of them wrote very powerful epistles. James considered himself a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude was, I guess, more humble. He said, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. So, these are people who could have acted like, well, we're the brothers, we're the family of Jesus, you know, and then maybe try to capitalize off of it. Today, how would that look? Um, you know, they might write books or create some kind of side ministry or some hustle and, you know, abuse people. Um, cults are started that way, by the way. Have you ever heard the story of the... The phrase, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Anybody know what that's about? Jim Jones, Guyana, or Heaven's Gate, you know? Well, Heaven's Gate was further from that, because Jim Jones apparently was a pastor or of a Baptist church. He kind of went off the deep end, didn't he? So... But for sure, the power of Jesus' death and resurrection was enough for his brothers to be saved. It wasn't something that was taken for granted. Jesus and John the Baptist had what we might consider a cordial, respectful relationship, even though they were first cousins. Or cousins. I won't say first cousins, I'm not sure. John jumped for joy in the womb when his mom, Elizabeth, met Jesus' mom, Mary. John, even though, when he was in prison, what did he do? 
it's said that if you interpret what he said one way, you might say that he's questioning Jesus' messiahship. I always thought he was just asking, telling his disciples, um, you know, to judge for themselves whether Jesus was the messiah. Now, did Jesus do anything to prevent John's imprisonment? Or did he deliver John from execution? I mean, they were blood. They were relatives. Couldn't Jesus have done something for his cousin? Especially one as, um, you know, faithful as John. In our worldly eyes, we might see that as family disloyalty. Yet Jesus pays John the ultimate tribute in Matthew 11, 7 through 14, which I'll summarize in verse 11. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there was has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Which brings me to this. This is not an anti-family message. And I'm going to tell you what Jesus said about families. In Luke 12, uh, 51 to 53, Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now, we might joke and say, oh, yeah, you know, that's a given, especially with in-laws. <laughs> or how about, uh, go to chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Think about that. We know that Jesus wasn't against families. First of all, he's God. And he said, honor your father and mother when he gave in the Ten Commandments. And he kind of reiterates that in Matthew 15, 3 through 9, about honoring your father and mother. Okay? Matter of fact, you can bring curses on yourself by dishonoring your father and mother. So what does this mean? Well, I take it to say, be warned. Do not take it for granted that your family members are saved just because you uh, brought them up in church. I'm afraid, but I think my parents maybe thought by bringing me to church and my getting baptized when I was eight saved me. I, I know that I wasn't saved at eight. And when I went to a youth uh, retreat in summer of 82, I got saved. That's where I met Jesus. And I had, I was dreading get, going back home because I felt like my parents would be disappointed because I, I you know, I, I know my mom didn't want to, wouldn't want to admit that I hadn't been saved at eight, but that's just the way it is. I know I wasn't. So, we talk about the blood, the blood being thicker than water when it comes to our natural families. But does that mean anything? Compared to the blood that was spilled on Cal Calvary? And unless a person is washing the blood of Jesus, baptism itself is nothing more than getting dunked in cold to room temperature water. And a word about traditional church revival services. I just wanted to throw this in because I grew up Baptist and Every year there seemed to be always a revival. There were professional revivalists. That's, that's all these guys did. And they had these revival services and they preached. And from my experience, I had to question, was there revival going on in those churches? Repentance. This is something that I've, I've been thinking about a lot lately. Repentance is what's neat before we talk about revival in a church. I've been to numerous men's retreats, including Promise Keepers. 
Um, some of them were kind of absurd. They would have all these like booths for guys who liked hunting and football and stuff, and you know they promoted all that. And it was almost like, hey, you know, come get away from your family for a weekend. But did retreating from from that accomplish anything? I know it did it for me. It did not. How are Christian men, family men, doing as a whole? So make no mistake, repentance is not just for the lost. Now about keeping families together. In the church family, Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. A church, in church, we should be encouraging one another. Especially if we're expecting people to come to church. Imagine how absurd it is for somebody to come to church and they just feel like they get this, you know, or, you know, indifference. That's certainly not healthy. Um, and hopefully, each of our, our own families are operating healthy and well. That's why elders are supposed to keep their own households in order because it's not just for appearance, but it's because the church needs to be operating well and healthy. The Father gives us his authority through Jesus, and the Holy Spirit empowers us. And as Pastor Nathan has been reminding us, each of us is called to be a minister. And it needs to be done under the structure of the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. It doesn't do for individuals to go off and do their own thing. And if we're going to serve, again, let's not have conflicts, but we also need to be submitted to the Lord. Dying to ourselves daily if we want to be his disciples. How about a growing church? The Great Commission. Matthew, we, Matthew 28, 18 to 20 is known as the Great Commission, but there are at least three uh, versions of it. I would say that all of them together make up the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Where is your Jerusalem, our Jerusalem? Shouldn't it be flushing where we are, flushing the line of the church? How about our Judea, Belmont County, and then Samaria? Samaria, who is kind of like the enemies of, of Israel. Uh, what we consider our neighboring counties that way. I'm from Guernsey County, so maybe I'm a Samaritan too. But it says, um, even our schools and workplaces, we're talking about a mission field. Every Sunday, I believe, Pastor Nathan, when he gives a benediction, and then when he's done, he says, go, you're sent. Another thought about the church is growing. In Acts 2, 42-47, basically the first church. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and 
breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Perhaps when we have church dinners, how can we use church dinners as an outreach? We can sit with strangers, make them feel welcomed, you know, serve anybody, especially if somebody's not able to, you know, who might be in a wheelchair or on crutches. But let's keep our eyes out for that. That's part of our, our call. Let's be hospitable and welcoming and loving. Jesus has given each of us gifts and talents that are meant to be used in service to him and each other. Let's not hold out. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through 31 says, Do all, 27 through 31, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. You take out the trash when your mom and dad tell you. You have to be told to clean up your room. How about in a church? <clears throat> Same thing. Do you have doubts or even care that God gave you membership in the church to do a job? Because really, that's what we're here as members. We have a job to do. 2 Corinthians 4 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. Paul wasn't just speaking to the, uh, for the apostles or his fellow leaders. He's, and he's speaking really to all of us. Because each of us should be leaders. So, think about hospitality. Because we are a holy people. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 9-12 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For once... For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I think I read that before. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war, wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent, excellent among the Gentiles. For that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they make because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God on the day of visitation. So, trying to wrap this up. I've only had, you know, 30-something years to prepare this in my own heart. So, 30 minutes or plus or minus. Um, churches have needed to be admonished and corrected since the earliest times. The Apostle Paul wrote letters to seven churches, at least. They should be, they, you know, this should be required reading for all of us churches, right? They're called the epistles of Paul. To Rome, to Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, Philippi, Colossae, Thessaloni, Thessaloniki. 
anything that you saw in these churches that were at fault, they weren't unique to them. And it wasn't unique to their time. And then we have the risen Lord Jesus himself having letters sent to seven churches also. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. The ones that stand out the most to me are uh, first to Ephesus, Revelations 2, 2 through 5. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you found them to be false, and you have perseverance, and you have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you, and will remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. I know where I've fallen from. I'm one of those, I've come to realize that I'm one of those who was forgiven a lot. So I have a lot to be thankful for. I have a lot more to love Jesus for. Is that really different from each of us? To Laodicea, Roman, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, 15 through 20. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Other versions say vomit. Very harsh. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich. And white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. When I read this about the rich churches, I think they're rich and wealthy. I think of there are obvious examples of churches that are rich and wealthy in the world and, you know, have a giant cathedral or a giant auditorium. and they, it's, it's like a big circus on stage, some of them literally. Um, do they, how do they esteem themselves in, in light of, you know, their fallen state and their need for Jesus? Is Jesus even welcome? That's why he had to say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he will, and will dine with him and he with me. If you don't, so what happens if you don't open the door to Jesus in your church? Again, a church, not necessarily our church. Why did Jesus use the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse, to state these admonitions to his church? We saw in the Old Testament wilderness years that God dealt very harshly with his people. He even killed many through earthquakes, opened up the ground, swallowed them, let them be bitten by snakes, <clears throat> also killed by neighboring tribes or nations. Um, aren't you glad that we're not experiencing that in our church? Now, churches that are experiencing hardship today, you know, we always think of the churches over there or over there. We hear the stories about persecution. But are they being persecuted because of their disobedience or because of their faithfulness? I look at it as, a, as an honor if we were to be persecuted for his sake. Jesus even said so. Thank God for his grace to us, the church, through his son Jesus. 
Even so, don't treat his patience and grace as permission to disobey. Remember, to him, you know, if you know that God wants you to do something and you don't do it, that's also, you know, that's disobedience. So if we're not being the church God wants us to be, that's disobedience. It doesn't just mean, you know, if you practice witchcraft, you know, obvious examples, practice adultery or witchcraft or whatever, idolatry. But just being indifferent, just not doing, obeying him is as much of a sin. So in closing, this was a very topic, a difficult topic to cover and relate this morning. It's actually, um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I could have spent hours on it. Yet we see how fiercely God protects and disciplines his own family. There's so much more to be learned about this by just looking at his relationship with his adulterous wife, Israel. Just look at the Old Testament and you'll see what I'm talking about. There should be no difference between a spiritual family and a biological family in the sense of what God wants us to do, you know. As long as we live in these bodies that God has given us, we are to be living like we were part of God's body, broken and holy at the same time. We're members one of another. These are clearly the end times. So in what condition is Jesus going to find his church when he comes to take her into his father's house? How about our church right here? Galatians 6, 9 through 10 says, So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Dear Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son Jesus to save us. Thank you that you have brought us forgiveness. Thank you that you have redeemed us. Thank you that you are redeeming us, your people. Thank you that you've made us your people for the privilege we have to be in a church family and to serve you, to honor you, to obey you, to be submitted to each other and serve each other for your sake. Please let this today, if we, if any of us are convicted, to let this be the day from now on, the day we move forward and be the people that you want us to be. Be this, Lord, your Father, you gave us everything when you gave us Jesus. Ten percent in giving back to you of our money. When you gave us 100%, you own us. We, owe, we, we owe our lives to you. Let us be your church. And sanctify us. And help us today, starting today, and every day from now on, that we'll just keep um, obeying you 